Thank you and welcome to our Gospel Coach training tonight. We have actually three weeks left, so we've gone through much of the hard part, to be completely honest with you, and we've gotten to the place where we're going to talk about some of the practical aspects of coaching sessions both tonight and next week. And then in our final week, we're going to do our assessment. We're going to give you a Gospel Coach Life Plan or a Gospel Life Plan. So if you haven't had an opportunity to turn in that form to us yet, um, if you haven't received it in email, please let me know. Or if you need it in print, please let me know. Because it would be a huge deal to get them all before next Monday so that we have time to review them before the final week. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, please do it. There's nothing scary about it. We want to fill those things out and we want to give you the best feedback possible to help you have a custom coaching plan for yourself so that you could grow up to be all that you can be in Jesus Christ. So our topic tonight is called Coaching Like a Shepherd Leader. Hope Don did a great job last week. Did Pastor Don do a good job? Wonderful. Amen. Um, so in our study thus far, we spent a lot of time talking about the five stages of spiritual growth. We've talked about some of the foundations of gospel coaching, and we've even spent a session on the basics of the gospel message. So today we're going to continue on with this topic, coaching like a shepherd leader. An important reminder as we begin is that a gospel coach cares about the person's heart, imparts truth into their heads, and often experiential wisdom to their hands. So we're going to talk about those three aspects tonight just a little bit. And uh, a reminder as well, to be effective in our coaching, it's ideally done in the context of relationship where we realize that it'll take some time and energy to equip people to live like Jesus. So it can happen um, in other settings, but it's best in the context of relationship where we know one another, we love one another, we share each other's burdens and our faults with one another. We give each other constructive criticism that we might continue to grow together in the gospel. So Today we're going to talk about four general phases of discipleship that Jesus took his disciples through. John 1.39 is come see. Mark 1.17 says come see, follow me. And then Mark or Matthew 11.28, come be with me. And then ultimately Matthew 28.18 through 20, go to the nations and make disciples. So this is kind of how it generally works. Jesus would go and he'd say, come see, right? Or somebody else would come up and say, come see. And then Jesus would share the gospel message and then they'd say, come see, follow me. And then some would follow them. And then in a closer sense, come see, be with me. And then ultimately there was always a purpose, right? Ultimately that purpose was to go, get out of here, go out there and make a difference, go out there and share the gospel with those who might still be hurting, those who don't know Jesus. That's the end result. That's the end game for those of us who are followers. So any gospel life plan must include this concept of being missional. If you recall from our previous sessions, we talked about personal, spiritual, and missional. So we're going to dig just a little bit deeper into that tonight. Those are the three spheres of a person's life that we want to influence through this gospel coaching relationship. So let's talk about those in a little greater detail. Each of these aspects must be brought into submission to the truth of the gospel. So spiritual aspects, this is an upward characteristic of our walk with Christ. It has to do with things like worship, idol identification, prayer and Bible study, repentance, personal relationship with Jesus, bearing the fruits of the Spirit. So how many of you enjoyed the idol identification part? One, okay, you're sick, you're in trouble, you got it, and no, I'm teasing she needed it. All right, that's good. Those are the difficult things to work out in our spiritual life. If we realize that we're worshiping something other than Jesus, those aren't easy things at first to contend with, but those are things that need to be moved out of the way for us to have a full relationship with Jesus Christ that ultimately leads to bearing fruit in the Spirit, right? That's what we're looking for in that area of our life. So also there's a personal aspect, the inward characteristic. So you have upward, you have inward, word that has to do with things like family, relationships with others, our finances, 
physical fitness, mental and emotional well-being, and time and energy stewardship. So those things need to have a balance as well for our lives to be complete and healthy and whole. And finally is the missional component outward. So we have upward spiritual, inward, personal, outward, missional, a ministry strategy, leadership development, coaching, vision casting. Ministry should be part of the life of every single believer. We need to get people fired up to live for him, to go out there and share the good news of the gospel, to fill the chairs with people who don't know Jesus. That's what this life is all about. So ultimately, a gospel coach as well as a disciple needs to be working on all three aspects of their lives in those regards. We need to continually grow in our uh, understanding of those topics that we just outlined, and we need to apply the gospel to our own growth in each of those areas. So I think we hinted at those in some of the previous sessions where um, sometimes you can get people that go off track in different areas. You can get someone who's so super spiritual that they're no earthly good, right? Then you have other people who might get so involved with the personal inward aspects of their life that they never live a life on mission. And then you get other people that might be so about mission that it gets their personal life out of balance. So as a coach or even as a friend, as we encounter others in our life, we want to examine those three spheres of their life and lovingly talk to them if we see things that are not in a decent and orderly way. We need to love them enough to coach them in those areas of our life or their lives. This brings us to a great quote by Martin Luther. Here I must take counsel of the gospel. I must hearken to the gospel which teacheth me not what I ought to do, for that is the proper office of the law, but what Jesus the Son of God hath done for me. To wit, he has suffered and died to deliver me from sin and death. The gospel, gospel willeth me to receive this and to believe it, and this is the truth of the gospel. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consisteth. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it unto others, and beat it into their heads continually, right? It's an important thing. We forget this stuff. How about, am I the only one who forgets it? You know, I need to be continually reminded of the goodness of God. I need to be continually reminded of how sinful I am apart from Him. And I, I need to be continually reminded of how much impact I can have when He is at work through me. Man, the sky is the limit of what we could do when He is at work inside of us. We truly can be difference makers for all eternity. You know, I, I've, I just think about the temporal things at times that we live for and how much energy we sink into those things that ultimately one day are going to pass away, be burned up, and are not going to matter one bit. You know, might we be focused on the things that have eternal significance and eternal impact, even as we've been studying in the book of Philippians and Paul talked of this concept of being poured out poured out to, to share this gospel message. That is the call on the life of a believer. This growing in the concept of the gospel will be a lifelong learning experience of which we will be delving deeply into at the start of the year as a church. So let's move on to the main topic of the day, coaching like a shepherd leader. Leading in a Christian sense involves shepherding, feeding, attending to, and keeping the flock. They use these agrarian terms that maybe we're not all too familiar with in our day and age, but I think you can relate to them. I think you can understand what he's trying to say. So Acts 20, 28 says this, Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. He's saying a very high price was paid. Salvation is free, but it came with a price. 
It came with the price of Jesus' life. And man, we need to guard it. We need to protect it. and We need to protect the unity of the church. We need to protect the unity between the churches. We need to inspect the flock and see what's going on for good and for bad. We need to go out there and look for wolves, but not always be on a wolf hunt, right? That can get a little weird, right? So we need to be about building up and edifying the followers of Jesus Christ and challenging them to grow up in their faith. But we also have this role as protectors of the body where we need to go out there and if somebody's trying to come in and destroy and kill the sheep, that we need to help them and guard them and protect them in that as well. He says, pay attention to yourselves first, right? Isn't that the first thing he says? So we need to be on guard in our own faith and we need to be thinking like parents and sometimes we can regress, can we not? You know, Mary Jo and I were talking today and she said, I don't feel much like a parent. I said, yeah, sometimes we're bad parents. You know, we, we got issues and we need help and we need other people, grandparents to come alongside of us and help us as well so that we can continue to grow up. We, we do the best with what we have in our hands at the time, but if we always keep a humble and contrite spirit, then the Holy Spirit can move through us and He can correct us and guide us and we don't you know, get all prideful and we don't hold back you know, from God. We allow Him to correct us and help us to grow in our relationship with Him. Hebrews 13.20 describes Jesus as the chief shepherd. We are but under shepherds. So sometimes we can get it all wrong and we start to think that we are the shepherd because if we're leading the church or we're leading in business or we're leading in our households, if we start to think that we truly are the ultimate leader, then we can get ourselves in trouble. We always need to be reminded on any organization chart for a church or for your home or for your business, guess what? The head of that org chart is none other than Jesus. If somebody else's name is on that org chart in the top position, then they are in trouble, right? Jesus is the chief shepherd. We are but under shepherds. The methods of the corporate world will not help us much here. 1 Peter 5.1 so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ as well as partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory." Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Sometimes in our work settings where they are secular in nature, so to speak, um, people advance through prideful actions. They advance by controlling others. They advance in different ways that just will not work in the church. If you try to apply those same principles into the life of the church, you can really hurt people. It's particularly dangerous and particularly um, a, a time where you revert back to this if a church is growing rapidly. So one of the things that happens, we, we just had an opportunity to spend some time with a church that's over near Jacksonville Beach. It's called the Church of 1122. And it's a really neat thing that God is doing. They have over 2,000 people for their grand opening. Can you believe that? Grand opening. I mean, they it was a very unique church plant. They bought a Walmart and renovated it as their church plant. Come on, Jesus. I mean, craziness of how they are launching in that setting. But the pastor there was describing the natural tendencies. Man, we've got we need 300 people to serve in kids' church, and we need 50 ushers, and we need this many people to do that, and we need this many people to do that just to feel the service. So there's this intense pressure at times on those leaders to fill those slots, and if they revert back to the business tactics, you start to think, okay, I got a leadership pipeline, and I've got to go ahead and make sure all these leaders come, and I got to be coaching up this leader to fill this slot. We need all these people here, and they better show up. But let me tell you, leading volunteers is a very different thing than leading people who are paid for one thing but unfortunately for some reason the church has things backwards and they will show up on time for work but they won't show up on time for God 
It's a strange concept. So we need to shepherd them and lead them well. It's a weird thing about how people react when it comes to the church. But what needs to happen is first and foremost, we can't be about filling slots on an org chart. We need to be about shepherding a person's heart about loving on them and caring for them and believing God that he will take care of all the roles that need to be filled. And believe me, there are roles that need to be filled to make church happen. But ultimately, this thing that we call church on the weekends isn't the most important thing, is it? I mean, it's an important thing. There's no doubt it's an important thing. Uh, get people together and corporately worship with one another to be encouraged. This weekend, we saw six people give their lives to the Lord. And at times we could take that for granted, but I'll tell you, there was dry seasons where I was in church. I didn't see five people get saved in two years. We witnessed six people get saved in one weekend, and I'm bummed out about it at times. So I had to remind myself and post it on Facebook and say, let us never take for granted the fact that six souls went into the kingdom of heaven this past weekend. Hallelujah, that is good news. You as leaders should be clapping like somebody's clapping over there. Let us give God some glory for that today. Do you believe that? Man, six people that were destined to go to an eternity without Christ surrendered their lives to Jesus this weekend. One lady just got out of prison, walked in there and came to know the Lord the very next day. One lady met us out there at the town of Orange Park Fall Festival, showed up that night and ended up surrendering her heart to God that night because crazy people were out there dressing like foxes and handing out balloons and taking pictures with people. And God used that to draw her to church where she heard the gospel message preached and surrendered her life to Jesus. I mean, how amazing is that what we're witnessing? Let us never take that for granted he said we need to stay humble in all this. We need to not be about our own gain. We need to go out there and make a difference with our lives. So these verses highlight four important characteristics of a gospel friendship, shepherding relationship. One, a gospel coach gives a reproducible example to those that they are discipling. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. But you know what that means? When you mess up, will you say it? I messed up. I blew it. Here's my inadequacies, here's my failings, here's my challenges. That's the point where I need the gospel in my life. I love you, I'm going to share with you the do's and the don'ts. You know, a lot of times we can learn more from the failures than we can from the successes, right? So this is where that openness comes out, where we're just like, man, if I blew it, this is what's going on right now, right in my life, and I need the gospel to do its work in me, in and through that particular thing. A gospel coach realizes that their own identity is that of a sheep and they are also in need of a shepherd. We're not the chief shepherd, right? We still are sheep. Ultimately, Lord, would you help us all to be under shepherds of yours? A gospel coach initiates relationships with the people immediately around them. So who are you initiating relationship with? When we talk about discipling and coaching, you remember that it has to do with people who are both saved and unsaved. You can disciple people who don't know Jesus. And each of us is going to have different skill sets. Some of you are going to be better at that than others. Some of you are going to be better called to minister to people who are already saved. You're going to have certain things that you can gift them and the, the ways that you communicate, the ways that you teach, the ways that you share, the ways that you love on them. Others of you might have that unique gifting almost of that of an evangelist. And we need to figure out who we are and how God would best use us. And then we need to look at those people who God's put in our lives. And we need to go out and start to share the gospel with them and coach them. Find the people that God's put around you. He's done so for a reason. You're a believer. You're called out. You're set apart with a purpose. He's got a purpose and plan for your life. He didn't cause you to drift there. He didn't put you out on the softball fields for no reason. He didn't put you at your workplace for no reason. He didn't give you the hobbies that you have for no reason. He's put you here with a purpose to share the good news with those around you. And the gospel coach initiates acts of service for others. They go out of their way to live a selfless life. Just like we studied this past weekend in Philippians, 
Chapter 2, as Jesus, or as Paul encouraged us through the words of Jesus and through the example of Jesus to live this selfless life, that's the life that we as gospel coaches and leaders in God's church should do. All of these things are generally outward facing. All of them are parent-like characteristics. And with this understanding in mind, I want to go about talking about four qualities of a gospel coach. Know the sheep. We need to be able to relate to people personally. In a church of our size, that means we need many people. That's why God has called many of you here, because there's no way myself or Don or Carlos (coughs) or... One second... Or Mary Jo can do this alone, right? It takes all of us to be out there. There's going to be people that you can reach that we'll never be able to reach. (coughs) Wow. Feed the sheep. How many of you like to eat? Come on, Jesus, right? We need to begin to nourish them with truth. We need to inspire them towards Jesus. We need to equip them in their areas of need, right? He's not talking about physical food here, but what that means is that we need to be growing in the gospel continually so that we can also pour out. It doesn't mean that you need to know everything. I know some people have approached this class and they're like, man, I don't know if I should be here. I don't know if I should be taking this because they've got some issues or they might feel that they don't know enough. Man, God will use you where you're at. He'll help use these kinds of things to clean you up as well at the same time. You know, God always has somebody in front of us and somebody in back of us, and we can all help one another. The person who gets saved that day can go out there that afternoon and begin to share the gospel, right? Think of the woman at the well, right? She got out there and she had, her, she had her message all messed up, right? She was even lying when she's out there. She's like, he, th- meet this man that told me everything that ever happened in my entire life. You need to come see this guy. He told her like three things, right? He said, you cheating, you know, you've been married five times. He told her like three or four things and she's out there. Meet this guy that told me everything about my entire life and everybody showed up and a whole bunch of people got saved. That was the same day that she met Jesus, right? So It's not something where you need to know all the answers. The Holy Spirit will work in and through you to draw other people to himself. And then lead the sheep. We need to invest sacrificially, overseeing every aspect of a person's life, guiding with spirit-empowered discernment. You know, this takes relationship to happen. You know, people aren't just going to share everything with you the first day if they don't know you. Some people might, you know, some people might just pour their heart out. They find themselves at that moment. But for most other people, there's this shell that needs to be cracked first. You know, a guy came up to us this very weekend after service and the Holy Spirit had penetrated his heart and through he had some difficult actions that happened. He came up to me after the service and said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And we went into the office and he's like, Eric, man, I didn't think I had a drinking problem, but I've got a drinking problem, man. I, I thought an alcoholic was somebody that drank every day. But what I'm finding out is that I don't drink every day. I, I, in fact, I didn't drink for two months. But then when I did drink, I got so drunk that I, I actually went in there and I put some food into the stove and almost burned my entire house down. Down because I passed out. My wife came home and the kitchen was smoking and I didn't even wake up when the fire alarm was going off. I said, yeah, you probably need help. You know, you came to the right place. Thank you, Jesus, that you would be willing to go admit that, you know, that he was comfortable enough to come up and say, hey, I need help. And we were able to point them towards CR and Alcoholics Anonymous and try to get them connected with some other people so that he could start off a journey of growing and his walk of faith and trying to defeat and go to war against that area of sin in his life. So we need to um, go out there and be willing to be in relationships. And one of the things that will happen, I can promise you this, you're going to get burned. You're going to get burned. You can't let that, I I call it turtling up, you know, like I have a tendency to do that at times. It's, It's a fighting term that we have, but one of the things that happens is when you're about to get beat up too much, you turtle up to protect yourself, right? And that's going to happen, and there's going to be some relationships that are going to burn you, and the, the tendency is going to be, heck, I don't want to be in relationship with anybody anymore. And, and it, it's, it may happen at certain seasons where you, you feel that way or you even react that way. But you ultimately have to open yourself back up to that love and that opportunity to share with others, knowing that occasionally love hurts. Any you ever been hurt in a relationship? Right. It happens. Right. That's part of our fallen nature. And ultimately, number four, protect the sheep, display compassion. 
comforting with hope in the gospel and fighting for their good. You know, we need to fight for some things. There's some things that are worth fighting about and fighting for, and we need to fight for those who are weaker in the faith so they could grow up to be all that they can be in Jesus Christ. So one, know the sheep. Let's go just a little bit deeper into these topics. We can't expect someone to follow our lead if we don't know them personally. The same is true with our relationship with Jesus. John 10, 14 through 15 and 27. I am the good shepherd, and, my own know, and I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So there's that sense that we as individuals growing in the gospel ourselves, we need to know the voice of God and we need to be close to him and and we need to know the word and and be able to sense how the Holy Spirit is moving. And that's part of our growth and maturation process as believers. And then we need to do the same with others. They, They need to know that we really care about them and that we're putting their interests first and that we're willing to take a phone call at 4.30 in the morning if they call to say that they've got an issue. You know, we're there for them and that we're not going to talk about their issues. We're going to be there and hold those things in confidence so that they can open up with us and we can get real and we can get as men and as young men past news, weather and sports, right? We need to get past those kinds of conversations to the deeper things that really matter. So we need to go into relationships. Bill Richard Baxter writes in his book, Reform Pastor, We must labor to be acquainted not only with the persons, but with the state of all people. What are the sins to which they are most in danger and what duties are they most apt to neglect? And what temptations are they most liable to? For I know not their temperament to disease. If we know not their temperament to disease, we are not likely to prove successful physicians. So what are we challenging you to do? We're challenging you to get into the life of some other people. And we're promising you that at times it's going to be messy, right? Those are the promises that you get in this. But where there'll be great fruit, man, yes, it's going to be awesome because there's going to be these beautiful moments of breakthrough as well where you get to experience just lovely, joyous moments in people's lives as they grow up. So coaching is an intentional gospel conversation among friends with focused discussions about the disciples' personal, spiritual, and missional life. So next week, we're going to really talk about the tactics of a particular session. Like if you were to adopt a couple of people that you're going to be mentoring or coaching, whatever terms you'd like to use, what does it look like? But one of the things that you'll notice by what we just said here is it's going to surround your personal, spiritual, and missional life. If you filled out that questionnaire, what were all the questions about? personal, spiritual, and missional, right? We divided them in that way for a reason because you're trying to assess those three areas of a person's life and then offer the best advice that we can empowered by the Holy Spirit to help them on their journey. So number two, feed the sheep, nourish them with truth. Matthew 4, 4 declares the word of God to be spiritual food. John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews just then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink of his blood, you will have no life life in you and a whole bunch of people bailed. (laughs) They're like, this guy is crazy. He's talking about cannibalism. What in the world is he talking about, right? No, he was he was talking figuratively. He said, man, you need to get in the word. You need to know him deeply. You need to experience him by devouring the word. So if you don't have that desire in your heart to be in the word on a regular basis, you want to know the best thing you could do? Pray for it. You know, Lord, would you give me that desire? Don't get all guilty over it. Don't beat yourself up over it if you don't feel like you're reading enough or praying enough. But man, ask God to ignite your heart in that area. Lord, help me have a desire to read your word and read other things about your word or go out and watch videos about the word. You name it, whatever way is your best learning style, ask God to give you a desire to do that. And sometimes it does take some discipline and obedience as well. Sometimes you gotta turn off the TV Dancing with the stars is cool, but it's not that cool, right? I mean, you need to turn that show off. You need to do whatever it takes to get some time alone with God. And there's so many distractions today. 
So many distractions. It's a very hard time and day and age in America to stay focused. Because, man, you can go to the... We were sitting at lunch with my, my parents who were in town today, and I look around the table, and I was tempted to do it as well. Everybody has their cell phones out, everybody's Facebooking, and everybody's doing, you know, Instagram, and talking amongst each other, and looking at the pictures that they're posting, and in some way we're missing out on the very conversation that's at hand, Right? We're missing out on some of those in our generation. We need to, sometimes it'd be kind of cool to go back in a time warp to 1988, you know, before cell phones and all that came about when they still had the brick. I'd still take a brick phone, though. Those were kind of cool. Like I said, man, I want one of those so bad. So if anybody go eBay, come on. That, if you want Christmas, y'all join together. Each did donate a buck. Give me a brick phone. I'll be happy. That'll be a great Christmas present. I just want one for retro purposes, you know. It doesn't even have to work or anything. I just She has one. See, we found a brick phone. She's going to charge me like 99.99. No. You know what I saw online? They're like 200 bucks now to get a brick phone. Yeah. yeah. They're like they're like a nostalgia item now, you know. Come on, it's a collector's edition. None of you remember pimping one? How many of you pimped one of those? Come on, you had one of those things back in the day. Only a few of you? Come on. I had one. We we hold that thing like you go sit down Maybe not at the bar, but you'd sit down and you'd hold it up there. And, and it was a status symbol for a season back then. I need a beeper, too. I need to just go back to a beeper and a brick phone. You remember those days. Come on, Ron. Beeper, brick phone. Ultimately, we need to prescribe a specific diet to our disciple to help them achieve maximum growth. One size does not fit all, as Eric and I were talking about today, right? We were talking about that today at his, his place of work. We were discussing how each individual, they, they say physically, fitness-wise, um, you can't just go have one diet for a person to get physically fit. Each person's metabolism is different. Each person grows in a different way. Each person's body responds responds to exercises in a different way, and the same is true when it comes to these spiritual and personal issues. Each person responds in a different way. So when we talk about this gospel life plan, it's not something that you write in stone and just put there, right? You need to kind of reevaluate that as you meet and as you go along because you're going to continue to learn how they respond and what works for them and how what works for you to grow up as well. And one of the beautiful things I found is that you end up as a coach being the one who grows more than the other person half the time. It tends to work itself out that way. So we must relentlessly proclaim the truth of the gospel in its application to the life of the disciple, appropriately rebuking, reproofing, and confronting the disciple to prompt them to align their living with God's truth. That just doesn't happen in church anymore, does it? And it could clear the place out real quick. It might happen <laughs> you know, if we start confronting people on this if they're not ready to change. So each person does need to come along at their own pace, so to speak. But if there's clearly things that are sinful in a person's life, we need to grow up as good parents. Would we not tell our children, say if they're smoking dope or something, you can't be smoking dope. That ain't right. You can't be smoking pot. One, it's illegal. Two, it's this. Three, it's that. And you can't be doing that. You, you shouldn't do that. So we need to get to that place where we lovingly confront people on the areas of their life that do not line up with God's Word. We just can't allow people who are believers to continue to go out there and live any way that they want to, worshiping other idols and not mirroring and imaging God well, but then they're proclaiming to be believers. It discredits the body. It does a disservice to the cause of Christianity, and it wouldn't be accepted in Jesus' day. You look at all the Gospels, man, they called everybody out. Boy, you're doing this, bam, bam, bam. He just went after it and got each of them where they were at at their point of sin. Ezekiel 34, 23, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed, feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. We need to inspire people towards Jesus, not towards ourselves, not towards Journey Church, not towards our ministry, not towards who we are we need to inspire people towards Jesus. He is the one that we're meant to glorify. He is the one that we're meant to lift up. You know, we, we need to always remember that because sometimes 
um, if God so blesses you to be very successful in your ability to evangelize or to minister, and you start to draw a crowd, you can start thinking it's all about you. We need to be sure that we're always pointing people towards Jesus. Even if it's not a crowd thing, what sometimes happens is people will see a breakthrough in their life out of some advice that maybe you gave them, but it was really the Holy Spirit that equipped you to give them that advice, and they start clinging on to you as their Savior. It's you that helped me get sober. It's you that helped me change this area of my life. It's you that helped me do this. And if you're not there, then my life's going to fall apart. And sometimes we have this sick tendency where we embrace that. And we're like, oh, this is cool. Somebody likes me. They're thinking very highly of me. And we can get ourselves in trouble. And you see this sometimes even when people come to the altar repeatedly over a same issue. Well, I got to have, you got to pray with me because the last time you prayed with me, this happened and things went well, you know, and it can get really weird if we're not careful and we need to make sure that we're continually pointing them back towards Jesus so they don't become like a Klingon, right? They just be, no, all right, some of you, you'll get that later. So we need to point them towards Jesus. We need to equip them in needs, experiential, detailed knowledge to pass on. So in those areas where you've had victories, the best areas where you can coach are the areas where you have experience. You know, so the, look for those areas where you've been through it and done it, and that's typically the thing that God will use to help you coach others. If you've been through a bad work experience and you came through it on the other end, maybe God will use that if you came through it in a godly way to help others who find themselves in the same situation. Maybe you're thinking sports or recovery from addiction or um, missions, you name it, whatever that thing is that God has successfully worked out in you and through you, it's a great area where you could give advice to others. And there's usually a natural tendency for people to come around you and find you because they've seen you succeed in some area of your life in that way. So God wires us up in that way. Use your trials and tribulations that you've overcome. Those are the best gift that you have to give to somebody else when you've gotten through it by the power of of the Holy Spirit. So player coaches are often great. Number three, lead the sheep. Leading implies movement, direction, and understanding. How do we lead? By example. It brings us back to 1 Peter 5, 3, being examples to the flock. As our coach, it's not our job to solve all the problems for those we're mentoring. We need to lead them to the solution. So we need to do that at times by asking questions. We need to do that by engaging with them and what they're doing. And we need to create movement in their life. So let's say it's a personal area of their life where there's some dysfunction going on, where there's maybe some marital difficulties that are going on and they're not willing to confront those marital difficulties. So you might give them at first some resources that they might study and then see how it goes, right? And if that doesn't go good, you might get to the point where you need to challenge them and say, look, you need to go to counseling. And that's the next step for you. Here's the number to go to that counselor. And maybe they don't go to the counselor. There might come a day, okay, there's no movement going on here. We're not meeting again until you do this. Or you need to go share this with your wife or whatever that is. You need to continually be moving them towards growth. You know, moving things are healthy things. All living things grow. Once you stop growing, guess what? You're starting to die, right? And stagnant things get stinky, right? So we need to keep them moving towards the goals that they've outlined within their gospel life plan, allowing for seasons of challenge, of course. When there's difficult moments, we want to be there to love them through those. But if their season starts to turn into a lifetime, come on now. you know, you got to do some things to help jostle them out of that. So how do we do that? We invest sacrificially in their lives. We lay down one's life for their brother. We willingly give time and energy to produce and reproduce healthy disciples. So how are some simple ways that that fleshes out? I think of my relationship with a good friend, Alan Bender. You know, Alan's a great guy and I love him and we talk and, you know, we go out there and we have fun and we go to dinner and we do different things and then we're there for him. So say his dad just got sick and his dad fell down and he pulled his hamstring and, you know, Alan was suffering and he's challenged and he's got these issues where he's going um, to have to go hang out with his dad and take care of him and his brother's coming over to help. And sometimes they just need a sounding board to be there. So he called 
me this afternoon and he's sharing from his heart, you know, like, hey, this is what's going on. And sometimes people don't need you to give them all the answers. They just need to get stuff off their chest, right? Man, this is what's going on. And then they'll come to the conclusion themselves because in the midst of their conversation, the Holy Spirit will reveal something to them. They're like, man, thank you for that. You're like, man, I didn't say nothing. You know, like those are the best moments when things like that happen, right? So when we get close enough to people where we have those relationships, God will work out those things. But we need to take the time to invest in their lives. And when the phone call comes, pick up the phone call. We're there for them. We do what we can to help them grow and see them come to be all they can be in Jesus. Overseeing every aspect of a person's life. First Peter 5 again, exercising oversight. Walk with a healthy sense of spiritual authority and lovingly share biblical wisdom into their life. So there comes a day where if they're doing things continually that just aren't lining up with the word, you have to be brave enough to share it with them, right? Man, this isn't good. What you're doing is not good. And sometimes if they're not ready to receive it, it could temporarily hurt a relationship. I gave an example this past weekend of my pastor who shared something with me 15 years ago, and uh, it was a very painful experience. It shattered our relationship for a brief period of time. He knew he was in the right. He was willing to have that relationship temporarily broken. Man, in about a week or two, I'm going up to hang out with him and his wife, and we're going to a conference together, you know? So, man, you know, God works out all those things. When you tell the truth in love, it might hurt at first, but let me tell you, later on, they'll come to that realization, man, that, that was true. And then they'll repent and they'll, they'll allow God to work through them so that they can grow up. So we need to begin to share those things in love. Guiding with spirit and power of discernment, we first and foremost ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and in turn ask the same for those who we are mentoring. So you don't have the answers, but guess what? He does. <laughs> He has the answers. Lord, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me understanding? Would you give me discernment? Would you do the same for those who we're hanging out with? Lord, help them come to those conclusions as empowered by you because he is the best advice that we could ever get, right? We don't have the best advice oftentimes, but he does. And that's what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. The Bible calls him the paraclete, which means the one that comes alongside. It also describes him as our teacher and our guide. If you don't rely upon him and you don't pray, guess what? You're going out there on your own. You're missing out on some great help and some great advice from the God of the universe. So protect the sheep would be the next one. Provide defense against sinful behaviors and errant doctrine. Sheep are prone to wander and there are false prophets, wolves out there that would like to devour them. Gospel coaches are watchmen who keep guard over their sheep. So we need to look out for that as leaders. If people are coming in and they're spreading some funky doctrine and they're spreading some weird stuff and they're starting to draw a crowd towards them and you know that it's not good and how do you tell if it's something that they're doing? Are they drawing a crowd towards them or are they pointing people towards him? That's usually the discerning factor. If they're trying to create a following of their own so that they can ultimately steal and divide and take, that is generally a wolf. What do you do with wolves? You go to war against wolves. You go to war against wolves. What do you do with sheep? You love the sheep. You bring them. You help them if they're straying. You're there. You care for them. You're there for them, right? So the general dividing line is, are they trying to bring people to them or are they trying to point people towards him, right? So that's what we always need to be on guard for. And, you know, I joked about it a little bit during the weekend services on, on Philippians when he talked about unity in the church. But, man, those are times where, and I'm not just talking about journey. I'm not, just so you know, I'm not trying to address any issue here. We're reading through the book and going through Philippians and the things that it says. We're not trying to say, oh, we got this stuff going on. I don't see that right now. But what we do need to do is, is aggressively protect the unity of the church. Like when people start to say stuff, we don't need to entertain that and allow them to do that. We need to be like, nah, that, that don't fly, man. You're talking about my church. You might be disgruntled. You might have issues. I understand that, but you shouldn't be spreading that. You're, you're speaking against the bride of Christ. That's not good. You know, If you're not happy with it and you really think it's the church that's causing that, then you need to go find another place where you can worship. But if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to hurt people. You're going to cause some people to possibly leave and to go to some other places, and maybe they're not called to. 
Maybe God's got them right there for a reason and you're going to sway them and you're going to challenge them to do something that is really not of God. And I'm not just talking about here, I'm talking about anywhere. When people get into that kind of funk, they're right where the devil wants them to be because his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. His job is to sow division into every church, not just ours. It's happened in every single church I've ever been a part of. Why? Because the devil sends wolves into them because he doesn't want them to be effective. And people sometimes don't even know they're wolves. They're just operating as dumb sheep, right? And they're leading people in other places, for real. And most people, in all honesty, they're not wolves. They're dumb sheep, for real. They, they don't know enough of the Word. They don't know, they're not mature enough. They're children in the faith. And then they react out of emotion and out of feeling. And then they say things. And they're not mature because if they were mature, they would handle themselves in very different ways. Who's partially responsible for that? The pastors, the churches, the leaders. Why? Because we haven't been feeding, leading, protecting, and doing all these things that the Bible's telling us to do. Because if we were, they wouldn't be behaving in that way, right? Because we'd be challenging them continually to grow up in their faith. That's what all of this is all about, that we would all grow up to be more mature. So watchmen keep guard over their sheep. How'd they do this? They display compassion. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They comfort them with hope in the gospel. Care for, comfort, come alongside, confront when needed, but also do it with the hope of the gospel for redemption and life transformation. We don't say to the guy who came up this weekend and finally had the courage to say that he has a drinking problem, dude, you got a drinking problem, you got issues, you're going to fry, you're going to die. <laughs> you, know, you don't say that to them, right? Man, look at the desire that God has placed in your heart. A couple months ago, this wouldn't have been there. Look at how he's changing you. He's inspiring you to do something different. He's inspiring you and empowering you to change. You had the courage to come up and share that with me. So always inspire them with the hope of the gospel, right? We don't beat them up and beat them down. We encourage them because God is a God of hope. The devil will do enough beating you down. We need to inspire them with the grace and hope and peace that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. We also need to fight for their good. We don't tolerate wolves, we fight them. We can identify a wolf because they generally draw disciples to themselves rather than Jesus as we shared before. And the Bible tells us in Acts 20 that fierce wolves will come among you doing what? Does it say it on your paper? Is that verse there? Not sparing the flock. They won't. They'll come in and they will try to take us out. So we need to know, feed, lead, and protect those who God has called us to coach. And believe me, even if you feel inadequate, there's people right here at Journey Church that God has called you to sow into their lives, to make a difference, to be there for. Even if it, it, it probably will start as a basic friendship. And I'll go back to my analogy of the Berlins. I don't think Gloria and Arnie Berlin necessarily thought of themselves as our spiritual mother and father. But they had a natural reaction when we came in. They saw us as young children in the faith. We had just surrendered our lives to the Lord. And they looked at us and we were helpless little baby sheep. Kind of like baby Lila that we were hanging out with today. You know she needs to be clothed. You know she needs to have her diapers changed. You know she needs to be there to love on her and care for her. And they saw us as that. That's what we need to begin to do. As people walk in the doors and we start to hear their story, would you be willing to take enough time to each and every one of you who are here be an extension of guest services? Whether you have a role that weekend or not, when the people start to walk in the door and you see somebody that you don't know, would you be willing to just walk up to, hey man, I've never met you before. How long have you been coming to Journey Church? I've been here a week. I've been here six years, <laughs> you know, or whatever. You never know what you'll encounter. But when you do that, get to know them just a little bit. What, what, if we don't do those kinds of things, what kind of divine connections are you missing out on? Some of those people might be your spiritual parents. Others of them might be people in need of a spiritual parent. 
You know, if we don't get out of our comfort zones and start going out and reaching out to them, we'll never experience half of the joys that God has in store for us. So I want to encourage you on the weekends, you're all commissioned to be part of guest services. Go out there and meet some new people and just see what God would do. Do the same when you're outside in the real world, when you're outside of the walls of the church sitting down at a Starbucks table or wherever you find yourself? Would you be nice to the waitress or waiter that's there? Would you just take an opportunity to engage in conversation and not turtle up because the God of the universe would have you out there sharing with anybody? I always look for those divine moments and those divine opportunities. You never know who you're going to meet. It might be that lady out there in Orange Park who maybe received a balloon or saw us walking around or had a picture taken and then she ends up showing up to her car a few minutes later and somebody else had placed a journey card on her car and she ended up showing up to the church and she said, man, God must be up to something. He showed me two or three different ways, this journey place. You know, I got to go there and see what's up. And then she gets there and then God touches her heart and she begins to weep and she says, my life isn't complete. I realize that I need Jesus. And you know, then you might be the one who's part of the altar team that would come alongside of her. Everybody has a role to play. And then she comes in and you might be there to counsel her and put her onto the right track. How cool would that be? Man, I long to see that happen in our midst, that this concept of parenthood would truly be realized. So it's starting with people like you who are here. There's going to be many more who are going to get involved in this. And I'm excited for it. So.